Uh, so, yeah. So today, talking about the the, the advantages of ZFS, um, it saved many of people's um, bacon uh, in a few instances. Uh, I, I've you know heard some stories about you know like ransomware attacks um, where um, people were utilizing ZFS and were able to use um, like rollbacks and things like that to to get out of it. So um, a great file system. But what we're going to talk about first. Um, is uh, the data corruption bug. So um, uh, I'm not too technically familiar with um, exactly what happened. So if, you know, Brian, Dan, anybody else wants to jump in, um, it's summarized a little bit about 2.2 appearing to have the bad data corruption bug, but um, I believe it's... Um, it's in earlier versions as well, potentially. Um, and the bug can cause... Yeah, go ahead, somebody. Oh, no, it's just me. Okay. It's just me unmuting. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt. Keep going. No, no worries. I just... I It, it does that sound, so I just want to double check. Um, so, dot can cause data corruption due to in, incorrect dirty D node check. Um, this bug is very hard to hit and really only came light came to light due to changes in Core Utils 9. Um, it's extremely likely that the bug was ever hit on earlier versions uh, when running Core Utility CP because they were using Core Utils 8, which performs file copies differently. Um, but it looks like um, some people have done some research that it could be happening in the wild since at least February of 2021 and probably was introduced into uh, OG ZFS back in 2006. And that would be um pre uh pre fork so that would be before the oracle split um and so the silent corruption issue became more prevalent with the release of zfs 2.14 back in march of last year and release 2.2 opened the floodgates and finally got attention after being falsely attributed to the block cloning feature um so i think there was one immediate release which was 2.21 i think that turned the block cloning feature off by default. Um, and then there's another release out 2.2.2, which I think um, addresses it. And then um, Dan, I don't know if you want to address the fix is a Lumo specific fix or is that. Um... Um, okay. So go ahead. Uh, all right. People can hear me. Okay, good. Um, I put in chat a link to the Lumos bug number. Um, which is related to what they discovered in OpenZFS. It is not a pool corruption bug. It is a file corruption bug. Basically, your file may, under circumstances, get a block of zeros written into it. And the reproducer script that OpenZFS came up with was simultaneously ported to... The, the reproduction script was simultaneously ported to Illumos by me and by um gosh darn it i'd have to look at the i'd have to look at the bug um he posted it on there um it is not the guy who fixed the bug in open zfs it's uh, another person and i can't remember if it's brian billador come on find him sorry i'm scrolling through it's not rob norris it was uh rich ercolani er er thank you ah rich ercolani managed to reproduce the bug on Illumos. Um, he's reproduced other OpenZFS bugs on Illumos too, some of which are still uh, need to be fixed. Um, but we'll save that discussion for later. But he, he, he and I reproduced the bug. The fix was fixed in OpenZFS by, initially by Rob Norris, and it was a stem the bleeding sort of fix. Um, and I ported that fix to Illumos so did two other parties in short order. Um, and basically, it landed in the current release of SmartOS before it was fully reviewed for Lumos Gate. The difference between those two is that we added a mutex hold and release around, specifically for the new extra check we made in... Um, trying to remember what that function is. Um, ah, my brain. Um, it, 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 ZFS is a different function. 
in ZFS they factored out they factored out a function that they call denote is dirty. And in Lumos we have it that function essentially inlined into its caller, which if I look at the Garrett, my apologies for being slow here. Um, function with the mutex is DMU object weight synced. That's it. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. DMU object sync weight. And uh, here's wait the sync. code. Yeah, weight sync. Here's the code review for Lumos. You could follow it if you followed the bug too, but that's the code review. And if you'll notice it's uh, patch history, I basically started by adding the extra check, which was the Dino dirty records mm -hmm. array. It's only four, TXG size is four. They just use that to hash and reduce contention. Um, that ZFS uses that to, to, to hash things out and reduce con contention based on the transaction proof number. Um, that field, if you look at the header file, DN dirty records, that field is supposed to be protected by DN mutex. And it turns out OpenZFS's DMU object weight synced, which is the caller to denote is dirty, holds the mutex before calling it. So we added their behavior right around the actual checking of the two lists for D, for DN dirty records and DN dirty link. DN dirty link, by the way, is ostensibly protected by a, a different lock in the object structure, but we found no evidence of OpenZFS holding that lock. So we, um, we are not doing it either. Um, before I added the mutex calls, I did run the reproducer and found that just checking the DM dirty records could not make the bug reproduce anymore. It could not generate all zeros where it shouldn't. Um, basically, it stopped the race with LSeq, seek data, and LSeq, seek whole. Both of those will cause the race to happen. If you look at ZFS's implementation of seek data and seek whole, you will find that it is inserting data into DM dirty records under protection of the mutex. So, yeah, that uh, that and that bug had been around. This this lack of checking here has been around since uh, that code was introduced in 2006. Um, recent open ZFSs. And the fact that the GNU tools use LSeq, seek data, and seek whole a lot more than the stock Illumos tools do, the DD program comes to mind. Um, I'm going to make sure. Yeah, that one. <laughs> I put it in chat. That program, the GNU version of that, uses a lot of LSeq for holes and data. Um, the Illumos one does not. It is uses naive brute force and ignorance. Um, so the OpenZFS people discovered this more recently thanks to a combination of some other fixes they would made related to holes and seek data, as well as the GNU tools and Linux, which would exploit these for their own purposes, and they discovered the hole. But the hole itself, this, this race, this hole has been around for a long time. The OpenZFS people opened it up wide, wide enough to discover it. It took us longer time-wise with the reproduction program to find the problem, but once we did, we did. So, and we fixed this as quickly as we could. It landed in gate a couple of days after it landed in SmartOS because we wanted to get something out there. And our testing, we did most of the testing for um, 16087, um, turned out that even without the mutex, it completely sewed up the hole and no more zeros were being written out inappropriately. Um, the next Illumos, the next SmartOS release, which will be this coming Wednesday and Thursday, will have the full 16087 in it. The um, impression, yeah, just to be clear, the impression I'm getting from what you're saying and also from comments I've seen elsewhere is uh -huh. that this is very unlikely to hit, so we don't have to do any like fleet reboots here. No, 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 you don't. Um, if you, uh, you know, unless, unless one of your compute nodes has 
workloads that have been triggering this and people are looking at you going, what the hell operator? Um, yeah, this is, this is not a, a all hands on deck update your fleet sort of fix. If it was a pool corruptor, it would be, but it's not a pool corruptor. It's at worst a file corruptor. And like you said, it's very hard to trigger on, especially on the Illumo side. Um, yeah, if, if any of your users are using GNU tools for things like DD and, and there's another one, I can't remember. I think Tar, no, GNU Tar, yeah. Um, yeah, those, yeah, GNU tools might tickle this more but it's hard and um, yeah, sorry. Big answer for a simple question. You're not gonna need to update your fleet immediately in a hands on deck situation, Marcel. Take your time. Thank you. Yep, yeah, you're welcome. Um, the next Triton release, by the way, folks, is the second, second week in January, uh, the 12th or something. I, I don't remember the calendar date off the top of my head. Um, it'll be, it'll be not long after I'm back from winter break. Um, and, uh, that people who run clouds tend to update platforms along with the Triton updates. So that Triton update will definitely have 16087 in it. Thank you. Least, yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah. So, uh, obviously, um, it's you know it was a big story that came out because and i wanted to talk about zfs and brian's like you know they're gonna want to talk about that bug right and i was like oh yeah that's funny that i wanted to talk about this and this had happened but um yeah so i thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about the history and the features um so you know similar to how we talked about the history of um how Illumos became Illumos. um uh, ZFS was um, part of that, um, you know, the closed source um, things that Oracle did. So um, Jeff Bodwick and Matt Ahrens um, were two major um, people. Jeff Bodwick was like the the lead on that of of starting the uh, right of ZFS. Um, so a file system with volume management capabilities began as part of Sun Microsystems Solaris in 2001. Um, and then in 2005, it was published under the open source licensing along with open Solaris. So, um, a, a part of Solaris, but a file system that, you know, eventually, as we know, was ported to other operating systems. Um, during 2005 to 2010, the open source version was ported to Linux, Mac, um, OS 10 and, uh, free BSD. And then, as I said, pl placed under a closed source license with Oracle, acquired Sun uh, uh, the 2009-2010 uh, era. And 2010, the Illumos project forked a recent version of Open Solaris, including ZFS, to continue its development as an open source project. In 2013, uh, Matt Ahrens founded Open ZFS to, to coordinate the development of open source ZFS. Um, and so Open ZFS maintains and manages the, Z the core ZFS code. Um, while organizations using ZFS maintain the specific code and validation processes required for ZFS to integrate within their systems. So just as um, Dan had managed or mentioned, you know, there's an Lumo specific fix, um, you know, with open ZFS, it's on various uh, operating systems. And so there's um, things and quirks between the operating systems that specific maintainers um, work on. Um, but OpenZFS is very widely used. Um, I think a free BSD might be like the largest um, uh, installation, I think, um, just as far as like the common operating system. People do use it on Linux. Um, there's obviously some things with the licensing that concern people. So, um, you know, packaging ZFS with like Ubuntu and stuff like that there, you know, there's, there's legal stuff that people are, you know, talk about like, can we do it? Can't we do it? But, um, but people do use it on Linux. So, um, but it's great on a Lumos especially. And, um, and of course on free BSD, you know, Alan Jude is a big, um, uh, proponent of ZFS and talks about and the benefits all the time. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a great system. 
Um, so just a little bit about yeah, for quite a while, Joint was the largest installation of production ZFS in the world. Um, running the the public cloud at Joint was um, uh, the most um, uh, the most servers of of any deployment that we knew of. Okay, yeah. So yeah, a large, you know, we had a multi multi uh, zone or multi uh, location um, cloud. So we had a few different availability zones um, with a lot of compute nodes, and um, ZFS was was backing a lot of that and or backing all of that, I should say. And of course, you know, mm -hmm. it's used for uh, Manta. So um, yeah, so we, you know, we've you know, eat, slept, breathe. Uh, zfs for for many years of course so you know it's it's the best thing around um you know i'm surprised there hasn't been i mean there's been attempts like i said to make things like you know butter fs but it's not it just it they're not as good um they still have their issues and you know with butter fs specifically you know you've heard of data loss and things like that where it just doesn't it's not up to snuff so zfs has just been an amazing uh product um uh, so a little bit of the data management so um, the management of stored data generally involves two aspects, the physical volume management of the one or more block storage devices, hard drives, SD cards, etc., including their organization into logical block devices as seen with operating system. And then there's the management of data and files that are stored on the logical block devices, a file system or other data storage. ZFS being unusual because unlike most other storage systems, it unifies both of these roles and acts as both the volume manager and the file system. Uh, it has complete knowledge of both the physical disks and volumes, including their status, condition, logical arrangement into volumes, as well as all the files stored on them. And now ZFS is designed to ensure, subject to suitable hardware, that data stored on disks cannot be lost due to physical errors, misprocessing by the hardware operating system, or bit rot events, and data corruption that may happen over time. Um, just one second, sorry. Um, it's complete control of the storage system is used to ensure that every step, whether related to file management or disk management, is verified, confirmed, corrected, if needed, and optimized in a way that storage controller cards and separate volume and file managers cannot achieve. Um, so this is why, um, it will, this mentions this a little bit later too, is why um, when you get, you know, a, a piece of hardware for from like Dell, right, and they give you, that PERT card that doesn't support like HBA mode, um, that's just not optimal for ZFS. ZFS needs to have direct um, connection to the drives. When you have like a hardware RAID card or something in the middle, um, it doesn't let ZFS do its job properly. Um, ZFS also includes a mechanism for data set and pool level snapshots and replication, including snapshot cloning. Um, one of the most powerful features that even other file systems with sna snapshot functionality lack. Um, a large number of snapshots can be taken without degrading performance, allowing snapshots to be used prior to risk risky system operations and software changes, or an entire production file system to be fully snapshotted several times an hour in order to mitigate, mitigate data loss due to user error or malicious activity. So kind of what I mentioned at the beginning that ZFS is great. Um, because of things like you know ransomware and things like that if you had i i saw one person on uh twitter they were like yeah if we had a ransomware attack and they were even using windows but they were using vms that were backed by zfs they could just roll back um and go back and still have their data so there's places where snapshots and rollback is really really great functionality in the enterprise especially um malicious activity um you know, user error is one thing, but we know that people are actively trying to attack systems all the time. Uh, snapshots can be rolled back live or previous file system states can be viewed even on very large file systems, leading to savings in comparison to formal backup and restore processes. Uh, snapshots can also be cloned to form new independent file systems. ZFS has the ability to take a pool level snapshot known as a checkpoint, which allows rollback of operations that may affect the entire pool structure or that add or remove entire data sets. Um, a lot of 
information here, but uh, data integrity is the big thing um, that ZFS has, right? So it distinguishes it from other file systems that it's designed with a focus on data integrity. Um, it's protected against silent data corruption caused by data degradation, power surges, bugs and disk firmware. So that is a big thing. We can't trust firmware, right? So we, um, I think, Brian, if you know, we, we had a specific manufacturer that had like a really bad firmware bug in the drives. Oh, we had tons of them. Um, we had, yeah. Um, like Toshiba drives were, um, like forbidden, um, at joint, uh, and that actually like floated up into Samsung. So like Samsung globally refused to buy um, Toshiba hard drives. Um, we also had um, uh, some old Dell systems that um, they didn't, they couldn't do just disk paths through. Um, and so um, like normally what you want to do if you have uh, a hardware RAID controller is configure it so that each disk is um, uh, a single or like each disk is passed through to the OS and you, you don't want the, the hardware RAID controller in the way. Um, <clears throat> but this RAID controller that we had on these Dell systems couldn't do that. And so somebody had decided like, okay, well, let's just make a RAID 10 um, and we'll, we'll pass the whole thing into ZFS and tell ZFS that it, it, it's just the one big disk. Um, <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, that RAID hardware, when you asked it to make a RAID 10, it would make a 0 plus 1 instead, um, going from the best RAID configuration to the worst RAID configuration. Um, and uh, that was a head node. Um, when one of the disks died there, um, uh, we were one disk away from uh, completely losing that head node. Um, so that turned into an emergency real quick one day. <laughs> yeah. And there's, um, uh, Brian Cantrell had a talk and talk, you know, he talks about firmware a lot, you know, obviously with Oxide working on, um, designing their own firmware for things, but, um, the drive manufacturer thing was, was crazy. And, uh, especially, and then Dell obviously shipping SKUs, um, that I mean, you'd ask for specific hardware, they wouldn't give it to you. Um, and giving us, you know, RAID cards that didn't support HBA mode, um, which was, was frustrating. So, um, and then I think there's another, um, just another firmware issue. I can't remember which manufacturer it was, but it was um, a set of like SSDs that would like, um, they would like, they would go to their write limit or something, or they would just stop working once they passed like a certain date. I think it was something with HP. And I can't remember who the drive manufacturer was, but I just remember something like that too. So, you know, firmware is, is a big, big thorn in people's sides a lot of times because it's stuff that you can't always access, right? It's a piece of software, or, you know, firmware that's like you don't get to mess with it or change it or see the source for it. So you have to like just trust in it. So um, it can be frustrating, but that's why ZFS is um, another advantage to using it when you have a lot of, uh, discs or especially discs if they come from one manufacturer um and they can get affected by that stuff um so he said for you know firmware phantom writes um misdirected reads and writes the disc accesses the wrong block dma parity errors um and server memory or from the driver uh driver errors and accidental overwrites such as swapping to a live file system etc um now Data integrity is achieved in CFS by using a Fletcher-based checksum or a SHA-256 hash throughout the entire file system tree. Each block of data is checksummed, and the checksum value is then saved to the pointer of that block rather than at the actual block itself. And then the block pointer is checksummed with the value being saved at its pointer. So uh, this checksumming continues all the way up the file system's data hierarchy to the root node, which is also checksummed, thus creating a Merkle tree. And don't ask me to explain that, but um, I'll, you'll have to look that up. But uh, I'm not an expert in that as well. But um, in-flight data corruption or phantom reads writes. Oh, I, go ahead. It, it, it's a blockchain. I'm going to run and duck and hide now. <laughs> um, seriously, seriously, folks, I, I use the buzzword, which has just been poisoned by the cryptocurrency crowd. 
by the way, I never say crypto. If you talk to me about it, is cryptography. If you're yeah. talking about Bitcoin and friends, you use the words cryptocurrency. Please, yes. thank you very much. I agree. But the Merkle tree is a blockchain of sorts. I mean, it's just a data structure that does its job very well for something like this, where all the transactions are logged and they can be traced. Perfect. Yeah, I can so. give a very, very fast description sure. of a Merkle tree. If you want. Go ahead. Okay, so think of a tree. You have your leaves. Your leaves are where all your data is, right? And so you take the checksum of the leaves, and then one block up, the parent is where you store the checksum. And then the parents of those checksums, the, those nodes also get checksums of the previous parent and all the other parents. And so it ripples all the way to the top of the tree. So at the very top of the tree, you basically have a checksum of all of the uh, children. And then those children have a check. So it, it ripples. It's basically the checksum at the very top describes the entire tree. That's it in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And that's how you get like, um, like Dan just mentioned too, the, you know, the buzzwords of, you know, the crypto and the blockchain, but that's, you know, an example of it, right. Is, is, um, for, you know, transaction, uh, verification, right. Is, so this works in the fact that the transactions is this, in this case are the data being written, right. So, um, uh, this is why ZFS, you know, was it definitely ahead of its time when it when it came out? And this is all like you know the blockchain stuff now is all like this is the new thing, and like they've been doing this for for some time. Um, it, yeah, like, incidentally, yep. the UFDS transaction history works the same way. Um, so if you have like a replicated um, UFDS database, um, uh, you can't uh, like a malicious actor can't rewrite the history of UFDS in order to like hide what they're doing um, because it'll destroy that, um, that chain on all the replicas and they'll refuse to replicate. See, this stuff is very useful, right? <laughs> <laughs> useful in, in more ways than one, not just, you know, losing data, but this, in this case, that integrity of something like UFDS where it's um, it has to do with um, authentication of identities and things like that. So, um, another example of that the technology of behind quote unquote blockchain um and why it's important um uh so yeah in-flight data corruption or phantom read rights are undetectable by, mo by most file systems as they store the checksum with the data zfs stores the checksum of each block in its parent block pointer so that the entire pool self-validates um so what we just discussed when a block is accessed regardless of whether it's data or metadata its checksum is calculated compared with the stored checksum value of what it should be if the checksum match the data the data is passed up the programming stack to the process that asks for it if the values do not match then zfs can heal the data if the storage pool provides data redundancy assuming that the copy of the data is undamaged and with matching checksums so um you know those some of these errors you might encounter with another file system um uh, you're going to get you know it's going to pass you back bad data um in zfs uh helps prevent against that um so you know there's uh it's optionally possible to provide additional redundancy by specifying copies which means data will be stored twice three times on the disk effectively having uh the storage capacity of the disk but it gives you that redundancy and additionally additionally some kinds of data used by zfs to manage the pool are stored multiple times by default for safety even with uh the copies one setting um, if other copies of the damaged data does exist or can be reconstructed from checksums and parity data, ZFS will use a copy of the data or recreate it via a RAID recovery mechanism and recalculate the checksum, ideally resulting in the reproduction of the originally expected value. Um, so if data passes the integrity check, the system can then update all faulty copies with known good data and redundancy will be restored. Um, if there are no copies of the damaged data, ZFS puts the pool to a faulted state, preventing its future use and providing no documented ways to recover pool contents. So that's a, a failure failure case there. Um, consistency of data held in memory, such as cache data in the ARC, is not checked by default as ZFS is expected to run on enterprise quality hardware with error correcting RAM, so ECC RAM. Um, however, the capability to check in memory data exists and can be enabled using debug flags. Um, so yeah, ZFS, you know, we call it an enterprise file system, right? So 
Um, you you do want to run it with uh, a lot of RAM for when you get those features like uh, art caching and then um, and the Zill and the, all those things like that. And so you want to have good, strong enterprise quality disks and of course enterprise quality RAM with ECC error correcting. So you're not getting um, the magic bit flip. Um, so RAID Z. So um, as we talked a little bit, you know, earlier RAID, um, traditionally, you know, or what people know RAID, right, is that you have a hardware RAID card um, that will do um, different modes of uh, bring your disks together. Um, ZFS is able to do this with what's a soft RAID, right? So it's built into the file system. Um, and while ZFS can work with hardware RAID devices, as we talked about earlier, it will usually work more efficiently and with greater data protection if it has raw access to all storage devices. So we mentioned this uh, uh, previously in talking about installing SmartOS and, and, and other things where um, the ideal situation is you have, even if you do have a, a RAID card, it has HBA mode so that raw disk is given to ZFS because ZFS relies on the disk for an honest view to determine the moment data is confirmed as safely written. And there's algorithms designed to optimize its use of cache, caching, cache flushing, and disk handling. And when you offload that to a RAID card, you're really not getting all the benefits of ZFS anyways. Um, and unlike most of the systems where RAID cards or similar hardware can offload resources, um, it is strongly rec recommended that these methods not be used as they reduce the system's performance and reliability. Um, so it's not uh, ideal to do the, the offloading and things that some of the RAID cards can do. Um, yeah, instead of hardware RAID, RAID, ZFS employs soft RAID, offering RAID Z, parity-based like RAID 5 and similar in disk mirroring, similar to RAID 1. And there's different um, schemes uh, that are available and they're highly flexible. So um, I'm not 100%, um, I don't have all the list of modes of RAID Z, but um, uh, Brian, maybe if you know, what is the... What is the usual, like the ideal situation for RAID Z? Um, I feel like I say this a lot, but it depends on the situation. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, if you're not sure, RAID 10 is a great way to go. Um, also, if you're not sure, RAID Z is a great way to go. Um, Either of those, you pretty much can't go wrong. Um, uh, there are some reasons why might someone might want to choose one over the other. Um, uh, but it, it really comes down to like how you want to balance out your uh, uh, capacity versus redundancy level. Um, so RAID 10 is going to be like direct mirroring. Um, and so, um, you're going to get like one over X where X is the number of mirrors you have. So if you have, um, like, uh, mirroring two devices, then it's going to be half. Like those two devices provide a terabyte of storage each two terabytes total, but you're effectively only going to get one because they're mirrored. If you have three, six, you know, whatever, you know. Yeah. 100 mirrors then you're getting 100th of your your raw capacity right um um raid z is um similar but um uh it's like um uh x minus one over x is your um uh, total capacity so if you have um three total disks, then you have two disks worth of capacity. Um, if you have 10 disks, then you have nine disks worth of capacity. Um, and then RAID Z2, RAID Z3 um, will reduce that by one each. So um, RAID Z2 is like X minus two over X. RAID Z3 is X minus three over X. Um, and you can always um, uh, stripe those VDEVs. So you've got... Um, four disks total, you want to do two mirrors of two. Um, the 
equivalent of like raid 10 um or like um if you're going with raid raid z um which is kind of analogous to raid 5 um doing multiple v devs of uh like say if you have nine discs three v devs of raid z each with three discs um so um i i always like to to um pick a level and then stripe after that um so usually with mirroring i would do two discs and then stripe there um with raid z um really it's a matter of like how much uh, like how many discs you have right. um and then do the math on that on like whatever's going to make that like um kind of a a square shaped pool um if that makes sense you know like you don't want your your v devs too wide um and you don't want them too skinny um right you know so kind of um you know kind of squarish like like i said if you have um uh nine discs you know three wide three tall right um or better example, like if you have twelve, um, going like um, three wide, four tall is better than going two wide, six tall. Um, yeah, like you said, you want like a square and not, so, like you said, not too skinny. So if you're doing yeah. it by that, right, that kind of gives you yeah. Like, but if you're if you're talking about like what's going to give the best performance, um, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, and raids your your redundancy profile for your pool layout is only one of them. So um, if you're looking for max performance, the best thing to do really is to profile it um, for your specific application and see which one works best for you. Yeah, if you're so yeah your application <laughs> like if it's write heavy, read heavy, um, things like that, or yeah, yeah, in, or in the case of um, you know, you know, you have, um, especially, well, I guess with write heavy, right. You're going to be making sure you don't, you know, you're going to be looking out for disc failures and you don't want too many discs to fail at the same time and have your data be, um, unrecovered. Well, I mean, in any case, it's about like making yeah. sure that you don't have too many discs fail at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then like, you know, it depends on if you're doing like all SSDs or you're doing, um, like mostly hard disks and some SSDs. Um, so it's, it, it really is like, you know, whatever pool layer you can do is, um, uh, best left to the judgment of, um, uh, the operator and what hardware they've purchased. Yeah. So and, sorry, it's kind of a non-answer. But... No, no, it, that that helps. It, what I was going to say too is that you know ZFS um, is great for if you do have like you can do that mix of um, you know uh, spinning discs, you know, because those are still cheaper, right, than SSDs. So you can set it up where um, you can have that mix and still get performance. Um, based on your, your profile, like you said. Um, so yeah, like you said, it depends on the situation, but um, there's ways to to calculate that. Yeah. So I mean, it, it's hard to go wrong with um, uh, RAID-Z or like a, a, a RAID-10 style. So if you, if you have no idea what to do, that's probably an okay one and you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, and just to mention on the tail end there, RAID Z and mirroring do not require any special hardware. They do not need NVRAM for reliability, and they do not need write buffering for good performance or data protection. With RAID Z, ZFS provides fast, reliable storage using cheap commodity disks. And the other thing I'll mention about like RAID cards, right? They have um, a lot of times they have uh, like the battery on there to store configuration data or something. And you know, you've seen. Um, failures where those cards the batteries fail or something and you end up losing your um your data because it ha it holds um some of that configuration data and it doesn't know the configuration after that so um another reason why zfs is a big advantage versus um 
using hardware raid. Um, so there's a little bit of summary of features. So, um, and there's a lot of this, but we don't have to go deep into everything, but designed for long-term storage of data in indefinitely scaled data store sizes with zero data loss and high configurability. Um, we talked about the hierarchical checksumming of all the data and metadata. So, you know, data is verified on use. Um, can store a, a user specified number of copies of data or metadata. Um, automatic rollback of recent changes. We talked about that um, in the event of an error or inconsistency. And automated and usually silent self healing of data inconsistencies um, and write failure when detected for all errors where the data is capable of reconstruction. So data can be can be reconstructed all of the fall using all the following error detection and correction checksum stored in the parent uh, blocks parent block, multiple copies of data held on the disk, write intentions logged on the slog. Um, ZFS intent log uh, for writes that should have occurred but did not occur after a pow power failure and parity data from RAID, RAID Z disks and volumes, copies of data from mirror disks and volumes. So, um, you know, that's why I asked about what, you know, what the ideal setup may be for a situation, right? Is that um, you want to have uh, the ability to uh, write from parity um, or make sure that, you, you know, you lose a disk and you're not losing all of your data from, from a, a particular failure or like a power failure, right? So the fact that it can um, store intentions logged on the slog, that means that you can um, have power failures and still have that data transaction written. So that's really important in a lot of uh, applications. Um, capacity, so ZFS is a 128-bit file system. So um, it has some really high theoretical limits. Um, and it says there, you know, it can address 1.84 times 1019 times more data than 64 bit systems such as ButterFS. Um, and the maximum limits are designed to be so large that they should never be encountered in practice. For instance, fully populating a single Z pool with uh, 2,120 bits of data would require um, three uh, 1,024 terabyte hard disk drives. And then you'll see these theoretical limits down there and this was all done um like i said 2001 when they were you know doing this obviously there's been improvements along the way but you think of things i like, think that's supposed to be like three times 10 to the 24th power okay. and 1.84 times 10 to the 19th power okay yeah that um, makes more i sense. think you you lost the exponents yeah, there that makes more that makes a lot more sense <laughs> yeah and a z pool with two to the 128th power bits of yeah, data that would make more sense 2120 yeah. bits is not a very big number right so um, right <laughs> but um so i'll have to fix that but just thinking about this was uh was interesting because i've you know uh, there's some videos with uh, dave Plummer, who was a um, ms dos and windows uh, nt guy and um you know ntfs it was the new file system when um, NT came out. Um, they have some crazy, you know, low limits and things like that, that they had to address because of backwards compatibility when they were doing things. So ZFS was really written with the future in mind. And so, um, you know, there's still challenges with, you know, NTFS is still around. Um, you know, EXT and other uh, um, file systems are still around, but, you know, they have these limits that ZFS was written to uh, e exceed them. And they're still having those challenges because of the fact that they have to stay backwards comp compatible. So ZFS was really, really thought of uh, the future was um, really important in that. And that's why it's, it's still a great file system after all these years and why other file systems really haven't touched it. And the fact that like things like ButterFS were projects where they weren't written with the, um, discipline that zfs had so you know that's just an interesting um, uh, tidbit there uh, some other features um, native handling of snapshots uh, native data compression deduplication um, and it says handle in ram it is memory hungry so when you do zfs you do want to have um, some ram set aside for some of the features um, 
It's unaffected by RAID hardware changes, which affect many other systems. Um, yeah, so like you could move, uh, like it's going to say there, but yeah, you could move hardware around, right? And uh, if this were to happen with like a RAID hardware card um, and the data is moved to another RAID system, the file system will lack information that was on the original RAID hardware which is needed to manage the data on the RAID array. And so that's where you can have things like total data loss, um, unless you can get like the exact same hardware, right? Or if you have like, you know, four or five of those cards in backup or something like that. So um, there's some great things with ZFS in that regard as well. Uh, uh, another thing is ability to identify data that would have been found in a cache, but has been discarded instead. This allows ZFS to reassess its caching decisions in light of later use and facilitates very high uh, cache hit levels. Um, as it says there, they're typically over 80%. Alternative caching strategies can be used for data that would otherwise cause delays in data handling. For example, synchronous writes, which are capable of slowing down the storage system, can be converted to asynchronous writes by being written to a fast separate caching device known as the slog, sometimes called the ZIL, ZFS intent log. Um, highly tunable and can be configured for optimal functionality. So this is what we talked about, about, you know, it's going to be uh, different for your use case, but um, it has all those options there. And that could be kind of a double edged sword in a little few cases, right? That it is so configurable that it can be confusing. But um, usually if you plan it out, you can figure out what's going to be optimal for your use case. Um, it can be used for high availability clusters and computing, although not fully designed for this use case, but um, you know, I'm sure uh, as we see things like um, Oxide building these rack level systems, um, you know, I'm sure they're, you know, they're taking advantage of ZFS. We'll see um, this in high availability clusters and, and uh, supercomputing and things like that. Um, so I didn't get deep into these, but encryption is big. Well Oh, sorry. ZFS has been used. ZFS is already being used a lot in uh, high-performance computing. One of the big drivers of ZFS on Linux was a group out of, I think, Lawrence Livermore. Um, they, they, yeah. Um, this is Brian Bellendor from Friends. They, they were, they were like, oh my gosh, we can store all this data on commodity hardware. Yay, cool! And they were one of the big, big, big movers of ZFS to Linux. Yeah, and that was the other thing, too, is that it's, you know, it, when it first was around, it was available, and then it became available on more operating systems. But we've seen um, a bigger commitment to Linux specifically, right? So they started, um, I think they started building OpenZFS on Linux, too, right? Is that um, well, here's how it worked. In the beginning, there was, a, there was Solaris CFS, and it was good. Then there was Open Solaris, and it was good. Then Oracle happened, and everybody was pissed off. Illumos became the upstream for ZFS, which spawned the work Delphix was doing in their own appliance distro. And eventually, ZFS on Linux pulled from Illumos as well as a port to Linux. So for a while, there was ZFS on Linux, uh, which was a downstream of Illumos. ZFS. Then I think Delphix. Actually, um, ZFS on Linux was a downstream of FreeBSD. Um, oh, sorry. FreeBSD was getting it from yeah. us, and sorry. Linux was a downstream of FreeBSD. Um, right. And then um, uh, the Linux guys started going nuts, adding features, and the mm -hmm. FreeBSD started like pulling in both directions. And then they were mm -hmm. like, you know what? We're just going to switch it around and mm -hmm. let Linux well, be our upstream. And what really made well, what really made what really made OpenZFS just get subsumed by ZFS on Linux was that Delphix Delphix couldn't keep up. Del Delphix moved from Lumos to Linux, still ZFS, but moved from Lumos to Linux in their appliances, mostly mostly I think because of hardware support, quite frankly. Um, but they once Delphix did that, they had no reason. To be beholden to a Lumos ZFS anymore, so they jumped in with both feet into what became real Open ZFS, what we know as Open ZFS today. Yeah, and we've seen things like um, so traditionally, like TrueNAS has been um, uh, free BSD based, and now um, I forgot which version it's called, but TrueNAS has like a, a Linux offering, right, that people are using. 
Um, and of course it still uses ZFS. So, um, it's become bigger on, on Linux as well, as you, as you mentioned that there's more, um, capabilities now that it's usable in, uh, a great feature on Linux rather than it being, um, I think unstable because they were adding all those features and being, um, not the mainstream one, but now, you know, now that it's further on down the road, open ZFS is way more stable than it was uh, before on Linux. So, um, definitely is getting great use there. And then, um, you know, the features right here, encryption, read write efficiency we talked about the caching mechanisms arc l2 arc transaction groups zfs intent log slog special vdev um i should have mentioned this earlier but the copy and write transactional model that's a big thing of zfs sending and receiving snapshots um so zfs send and receive is huge um and so that's you know something you just don't see in other file systems um, dynamic striping, variable block sizes, lightweight file stream creation, um, file system creation, sorry, adaptive Indianness and deduplication. So, um, the list of features is, is just massive. Um, and it just shows you why ZFS, um, is still, you know, the, the best file system around and why, um, it's used in enterprise. So, um, there's no, uh, there's no equivalent. And like I said, others have try, tried to make it, but um, I'm trying to think specifically what happened with one thing that happened with ButterFS, but um, I know there was some like big data loss. And so it's just not going to be chosen for, for enterprise. Um, and then the snapshot sending and receiving is, is just great because you can do that, um, you know, move your data around where you need to, um, you know, if you have something like an attack or something like that and you need to move it to another um, uh, compute node or something like that. In, in the case of Triton, right. Um, you're able to do that and and have a new machine come up and things like that. So the feature list is just endless. Um, and, um, uh, that's pretty much all I had to present on ZFS. But, um, if there's, uh, questions or things that you guys wanted to talk about, let me open the chat really quick. Just to see if there's, um, anything there. There's a third, <laughs> I'm missing a lot, a lot of chat there. Um, Jasper said, I always thought ZFS channel programs would have been more popular. ButterFS couldn't even tell you how much free space you actually had for a long time. Yeah, it was. you're basically using a beta of a file system, right? So you're not going to trust your enterprise level storage <laughs> to, a, to a, a program in beta, right? Because data is, you know, data loss is not something you want and you couldn't trust something like ButterFS. Um, do you know, who, does anybody know who owns, I, I just off the top of my head, do you know who owns the ButterFS project? The Linux kernel does. Linux kernel does. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. And there's also things, um, with, uh, as I was looking at the, um, I, 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 I thought it was an Oracle thing too, but I may be incorrect on that. Um, uh, I was also, well, I mean, as, as with a lot of things that are, um, uh, like the repo of record is the Linux kernel tree. Um, like the single most ownership person would be Linus Torvalds himself. Right. Um, but like he doesn't write the vast majority of code that goes into the Linux kernel these days. Um, it, there's significant contributions from um, like Oracle or IBM Red Hat. Um, you know, yeah. he may not have ever even written a single line of code that's in ButterFS. Um, yeah. But the um, like cabal of um, Linux kernel contributing companies have like collectively authored it and included it in, um, uh, in the kernel tree. Um, and I think even the way it works out is like, um, 
individual contributions are like technically owned by the individual contributors. Um, so, um, like, I don't, I don't think you could even say that there is like a single owner of ButterFS or even the Linux kernel itself. Um, even though like, um, Linux is like kind of the, the, um, you know, benevolent dictator for life guy, right? Um, uh, ultimately, all decisions are up to him. Yeah. Um, uh, he could like take his ball and go home and like, you know, stop being involved suddenly and like delete the repos. Um, you know, everybody else has their own copies. So it'd be like, you know, a, a power struggle amongst everybody as to like, you know, what's the authoritative or canonical version of Linux after that. Um, but um, yeah, there's no one like owner. Um, so like each, each line is like probably like owned by whoever the git blame says owns that line or whoever, you know, can, uh, committed that line. Like that's going to be like the owner of that line of code. Yeah. With ButterFS so. specifically, um, we, we mentioned Oracle was that, um, Oracle actually did provide commercial support for it. So, um, in Oracle Linux from yeah. version seven, they provided commercial support, um, Susan Linux did too, um, and Synology Disk Station Manager. I think they all, those three that I just mentioned provide support. But RFS was included as a technology preview in Red Hat 6 and 7, but it was removed from um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux in 2018, so they no longer support ButterFS. Because um, it was interesting, because I was looking at Oracle Linux recently, um, you know, because they have... Um, Obviously, Oracle has uh, the bits for uh, the original Solaris ZFS and uh, DTrace, right? So they actually have implemented DTrace um, in Oracle Linux, which Oracle Linux is just Red Hat uh, Linux, but with Oracle support. They actually do have their own kernel, the Unbreakable kernel. I forgot what it is. Yeah, Unbreakable Which kernel. is just branding. <laughs> yeah, um, it's just branding. I mean, they, they do have some... Um, changes to it that are um different than um than what's in red hat um but the distro mostly is just a clone of red hat linux um, yes but yeah they, they've got some changes in the kernel um but like unbreakable is is just branding it's it's no more resilient to anything than <laughs> any of the rest of the Linux community is. Yeah, it's just, it's a way, um, it's like a way for Oracle to put their foot in, right? And to get you, if you're getting support from them, to have um, more uh, control over the support contract. Uh, because they do mention that it's basically, even with the, the Oracle kernel, um, all your applications should run exactly like they would on a, a comparable version of red hat right so um it's for people who yeah happen to have a support contract with oracle they're like hey we use linux should we go to ibm and red hat and they're like no just come to us we'll support oracle linux um and oracle yeah was... i mean it, go ahead what it's really for is um if you're running oracle database yes you know exactly um that way just like you know apple wants to provide the entire stack um you know, hardware all the way through, um, you know, end user interface and applications, right? Um, if you're running Oracle Linux, or I mean, if you're running Oracle database, um, it's a lot easier for Oracle to say like, okay, well, here's how the operating system underneath it works. And you should trust us because um, you got both from us rather than um, playing like the vendor blame game where you have a problem with Oracle and Oracle says like, oh, well, that's Red Hat's problem. And then you go to Red Hat and they're like, well, that's actually Oracle's problem. Um, or, you know, that's a, you know, that's Dell's problem or whatever, you know, Oracle will sell you hardware operating system and, um, you know, database application. Um, and like, if you're spending the money on running Oracle database, I mean, 
we provide software that competes with Oracle operating systems. Um, but if you're running Oracle database and you're spending the money on that, you probably want to be running it on Oracle Linux on Oracle purchased hardware. Yeah. So you'll have uh, a, an easier time at the end of the day doing that. Yeah. It's like, um, I don't know if they still have, but you know, Oracle was selling, you know, their ZFS appliances as well. Um, to to enterprises right? yeah i don't know if they still have that yeah i'm, I'm not sure i know they had it because like people who were using um like oracle products like um their um erp and stuff like that you know they would suggest oh get an oracle zfs um box i think even um one of the customers that we work with had had some of those um so they kind of sell it as like a bundle if you're getting certain software um using like their LDAP and stuff like that to use their ZFS storage appliance, but um, not sure where, where the support is on that. And I'm not sure, um, you know, like obviously we saw like a big uh, reduction in force as or calls it riffing um, of the Solaris uh, team uh, a, a year, a couple years back. Um, I know there's still people working on it like Alan uh, C and stuff like that, but, um, you know, we obviously don't know how much they're working on ZFS now. You know, Open ZFS has obviously taken over, so you know that's that's a thing there too. Is that um, even with the closed source stuff, we know we've gone and we've made a bunch of improvements, and Oracle can't go and take those back and say, "Oh, we we have this," you know, because all of this has been written by the contributors after the closed source bit. So. Um, you know, it's it's been a big change. It was just funny too because Oracle was the one coming out after the IBM thing, saying keep Linux open, like after they have been the you know done all the things they did with closed sourcing. And they're it's funny that they're saying keep um, keep Linux open to Red Hat. Like, hey, you guys have done done this stuff too, so I can't believe you're saying that. So, um, you know, that was just a big thing too. Because I was reading about Oracle Linux, like I was just curious about like D Trace how it's different, um, Oracle's implementation and all that. Cause I know like EPPF and the tracing tools there, like what Brendan Gregg talks about are, are big, but you know, D trace is still, um, is still widely used. So, and that was another thing too, is that, um, you know, D trace, uh, for ZFS is, is, you know, doing, figuring out ZFS problems is available too. So, um, there's all sorts of great tools around ZFS as well. Um, and it's being more widely used by um, smaller shops, not just enterprise shops, but, you know, a lot more people are turning turning to ZFS because of the features that it has. So um, is there any other, let me check the chat again. Is there any other questions? Or Yeah, I, Go ahead. I actually do have a question. Sure. So, I mean, when ZFS was originally created, we were dealing with a world of spitting rust. And um, as things have been advancing, we are obviously uh, dealing with increasingly fast disks. So we've moved now, from, or the world is moving now from spitting rust increasingly to SSDs uh, and even NVMe. And so one of the things that I'm wondering about, for example, is like the contention on the Z-Log, the ZIL. Uh, is that I suspect that that will progressively become more of a bottleneck because I mean it seems to me that one of the one of the big reasons to move like to SSD or even to N NVMe is to take advantage of write performance because there's a especially with this uh, L2 arc right um, sorry not the L2 arc with with the arc that we that you're very likely to hit if you're doing a read but if you're doing a write there's a big advantage then to using like something like an SSD or an NVMe. But if you're doing writes first to the log, then it seems to me that you would have increasing contention on the log itself. Is this roughly correct? It's, it's, so I don't ahead, think Brian. it's an issue. Um, uh, there's always a ZFS intent log, even if you don't have a dedicated log device. Um, if you have SSDs, then there's no point in having a dedicated log device. 
Uh, uh, because... I, 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 I don't be so sure about that oh. one, Brian, but keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you're, you're not going to get any speed benefit out of it for sure. If you're, if you're all SSD, um, Um, I I say. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Um, early, early in my post Sun career, SSDs were start when SSDs were starting to show up. People had seen that, um, and this might be a might have been a function of the state of the art of SSDs in the in the 2010s. That even with an all SSD array, it still was beneficial to have. A dedicated slog device. I believe it had something to do with latency, and I can imagine if you have a bunch of SATA or SCSI SSDs, but then you have some NVMe devices as slog, where presumably the latency in NVMe is substantially less than it is even to SSD over the traditional disk buses like SATA or SCSI. I can imagine in some cases where you have that display, that that difference in latency, you still want to have your lowest latency devices act as slog. But most of my data and anecdotes there are from five to eight years ago. So I don't know what the modern state of things is. For example, in, in if you purpose built your systems to be nothing but MVME from the start, that statement might be true that slog isn't nearly as important. Um, I personally don't have specific experience with it. Um, we did have it. some at Joint, but like I was never the person that was like hands on keyboard dealing with those things. Um, but um, Oxide is heavily contributing all of their NVMe stuff into a Lumos gate, and we inherit all of that stuff automatically. So as good as it is on Oxide, we should have um, parity with uh, performance and features. Um, I will say, uh, in addition, Jasper just pointed out on the chat that he's been running in uh, SmartOS Triton on NVMe without any issues. So is one of our larger customers. They have one of our larger customers has more than a few compute nodes in their very large deployment that are all NVMe all the time. Um, and Nick, I know we're an all SSD shop. Do we have any all NVMe deployments? Um, we are moving towards all NVMe. So our next data center will be all 100% NVMe. Well, there you go. Thank you very much, yeah. gentlemen. Yeah, sorry, I tripped over my MagSafe cable there. Um, yeah, and also, um, I don't know if you mentioned this while I was down there for a second, um, that that Oxide had been avoiding the firmware issues, right, with NVMe. You mentioned that, Dan? Right? Yes. Yeah, so, they're basically yeah. doing all their I, own. I, I, I said that kind of like that was a lot. All of Oxide's decisions have been based on pain from prior experiences, and one right. of them is drive firmware and HBA cards, as a rule, tend to suck. The only question when you're using them is which ones suck the least. So yeah. they threw that all out the window and just went. They they made they based that in all NVMe design decision based on prior pain. Everything Oxide does is a trauma reaction, right. and it makes sense viewed in that light. Everything they do makes a lot of sense, and I think it served them well. Yeah, and like you said, increasingly, um, you know, NVMe you know, speeds are even getting crazier with, you know, uh, newer PCI Express standards um, and then prices dropping, right? So people are, you know, bypassing, um, you know, you don't have to go through another bus. You're just going straight through PCI Express, which gives you that advantage of all that speed. Um, and so we're going to increasingly see more um, NVMe, support and more NVMe based systems based on the fact that, you know, prices drop um, and they're doing less manufacturing of spinning disks, although they're still doing that. They're still making spinning disks, but it, you know, as an option now is to get super fast NVMe drives. I mean, some of them, I think, 
um, you know, it's you can't even get the full speed until you get the new PCI Express board. I think I was looking at one NVMe that was like just amazingly fast. So, um, you know, there's that there's that feature there. So a lot of cool technology coming out. I don't even think there's I think I saw that there wasn't even like a PCI Express 5.0 certification um, like boards will have the the feature, but um, it's not like certified until 2024. So um, we'll we'll see on that. But that's obviously going to en enable as well um, to have faster network cards as well. So you know more 100 gig, 200 gig, 400 gig networking to be available as well. Uh, is there any other um, questions or anything uh, people wanted to discuss? All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, we'll continue the discussion on Discord and uh, various channels. But um, thank you, everybody, for attending. Great um, uh, great office hours today. Thank you very much. And uh, like I said, we'll see you on the, the various channels. And um, we'll see you next office hours. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for coming. See you guys.